Making Indian White, The Judicial Abolition of Native Slavery and Revolutionary Virginia and Its Racial Legacy. And we are in part two now. So it's Robin versus Hardaway, its progeny, and the legal reconceptualization of slavery. Indian freedom suits and racial determination. Slaves could not easily obtain legal freedom in colonial Virginia. The assembly imposed ever increasing restrictions on manumission. By the mid 18th century, a master could free his slave only for meritorious service as judged by the colony's governor and his council. Even then, a freed slave had to leave Virginia within six months upon threat of a fine for the owner. Now you hear that? You had to leave. These deterrents made manumission extremely rare in 18th century Virginia, with only a few formal requests in any given decade. So they didn't even do these requests because they didn't even want to leave. Slaves who were freed illegally faced seizure and forced sale by the country court. In 1728, the church wardens of Northampton County petitioned the county court complaining that Tom, an Indian boy slave, has by the last will and testament of Isaac Hageman been pretendedly set free contrary to the act of assembly. Unable to seize the boy on their own, the wardens requested that a constable seize the boy so that he may be disposed of as the law directs. The court granted the petition and Tom was sold. Such stories demonstrate concretely the impediments to manumission, even when a master willingly gave up his valuable human property. Again, valuable human property. It was an Indian boy slave. And even if he had his freedom, they did other things, other policies, other laws to make sure he was, you know, kept as a slave all his life. Because it says Tom was sold, right? One legal avenue to liberty did remain open, however, the freedom suit. From the beginnings of slavery in Virginia in the 17th century, slaves could sue their masters in court and claim that their enslavement was unlawful. Did you know that? Did you know slaves in the 1600s can sue their masters and eventually sometimes win their freedom? Did you know that? That's not what they teach us in history. If they were successful, they received their freedom and often damages as well, and often damages as well. So how do you gain your freedom and all of a sudden have acres of land and money? Well, now you know. Compared with the strict requirements for manumission, these provisions seem generous, but they reinforce the slave system. They bolstered the notion that slavery rested on the rule of law, dividing slave from free and black from white. In a strict legal sense, freedom suits were not about race. Since 1662, Virginia law had provided that slavery descended matrilineally, and therefore the dispositive issue was whether the petitioner's mother had been a slave. But in society with a few free Africans, the legal status of the mother almost always turned on her race. The vast majority of freedom petitions therefore claimed that descent from a white woman made the petitioner slavery illegal. Resolving these cases were relatively simple. Since by law, whites could not be slaves, courts would sub poena knowledge, knowledgeable locals. So you hear that. So by law, whites cannot be slaves. So if you were considered a child of a white uh, woman, then you were free automatically. In 1732, for instance, Nanny Bandy proved that she was the mulatto child of a white woman. Deciding she had been leg illegally detained in slavery, the court freed her children upon her petition the following year. However, even a favorable verdict did not guarantee manumission. Now, we got to be very careful, right? Because we already saw in the past video that a lot of the Native American uh, or American Native uh, peoples were being classified as white, right? Just like we heard in the other video that his mom was being classified as white. And we already know about mulatto. So was that was that really a white person? And was she really a mulatto? You know, think about that. However, even a favorable verdict did not guarantee manumission. The ambiguous line between black and white, slave and servant, meant that individuals legally entitled to their freedom often face years of forced labor 
for masters who routinely disregarded indenture agreements and judicial decrees. All right, so you hear that? White masters, so again, white masters were making, you know, American natives who were legally entitled to their freedom, basically forced, right? Forced labor and disregarded your indentured agreement you had with them and the judicial decrees you had with them, keeping you in chattel slavery. Well aware that the legal apparatus of society would rarely intervene to protect the rights of racial inferiors. Enslaved Indians also sued for their freedom, although they rarely alleged white parentage. Instead, they claimed as Indian Will did in his 1747 petition for freedom that the laws of your country is entirely against freeborn Indians to be made slaves. Such an argument begs the question for given the ambiguity between Indian slavery and servitude that had existed in previous generations. Determining who was freeborn was not straightforward. Given the commonality of racial mixing, appearance provided no solution, and documentation clarifying the legal status of a slave's mother was rare. To solve this dilemma, the courts turned to communal memory. In the case of Anne Williams Indian, for instance, the court dispatched Michael and William Christian to investigate Anne's claims to freedom. The Christians deposed almost 20 white community members about Anne's mother Jane. All the witnesses reiterated the same two points. They all took the SD wench Jane to be an Indian, but they knew nothing of her being free and stated that she lived a slave and died as such as far as they knew. Faced with the Christian's report, the court concluded that Anne had no right to her freedom. So you hear that, right? So even though the white people said, yeah, we knew she was an Indian, they're talking about her mom, right? We knew she was an Indian, but she was also a slave. She was born a slave and died a slave. So the court was like, well, your mom was a slave, even though she was an Indian, then you're going to be a slave too. So what does that make this so-called Indians? These are so-called Negro people, right? This outcome was not universal, as some Indians did successfully win their freedom in court. But the court's reliance on the opinion of white community as proof set the odds against the Indians. Of course that would happen. As Indians will, as Indian Will argued in his petition, his mother was very well known to be a free Indian by several white inhabitants now dwelling in this country. But they had kept silent not caring to curry ill will of their neighbor. In such instances, there was little reason besides honesty for whites to support Indian claims, but there was powerful incentive to oppose them. Powerful. They'd rather lie. They'd rather lie in these court cases. That's what was going on. Indentured white servants were being given their freedom of after their indentured servitude was completed, the contract or the judicial decree was completed. On the other hand, American Indians, so-called Negro, you, was not given the same um, rights. They were not fulfilling your contract. They were keeping you as a servant slash slave. And eventually it be did become chattel slavery, what we know of slavery. But it didn't start out like that. This is what I'm trying to show you. Race played different roles in these Indian freedom suits and the more frequent cases alleging white ancestry. For slaves who claimed descent from whites, the presumption of freedom for Europeans made the race of the mother dispositive. These lawsuits thus hinged on determining the race of both the mother and the plaintiff. In pre-evolutionary Virginia, however, Indians could be slave or free. As in the case of Ann Williams, merely pro proven descent from an Indian carried no presumption of freedom. It was also necessary to establish the mother's free status, a tricky proposition when few documents existed. You hear this? And their treatment of Indian laborers often amounted to slavery, whatever their formal legal status. Indian identity, in other words, continued to have an ambiguous legal meaning. Certainly, natives were lumped with other people of color and therefore labored on, under significant legal disability. 
But in the fundamental division between slave and free that structured Virginian society, Indianness was neither an inherent badge of slavery, like blackness, nor a badge of freedom. Again, just because you were of a dark skin, right, or black, or if because you were Indian, this basically did not inherit you or the tag of a slave, right, or freedom. So it wasn't the rule. Like whiteness, it was its own racial class and it forced the courts to deal in particularities of status rather than race-based generalizations. Okay, so the first uh, thing you see here on the screen, the first name, this person here is my grandmother's mother, mother. So I guess, so I guess that would be my, uh, third time great grandmother or fourth time great grandmother. But the point of this is I'm trying to show um, the different classifications. So we're starting with the 1850 census, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. yep, so this is the 1850 census, Harriet Callaman, and uh, her race is mulatto. And we're gonna click into the census here. Yeah, here they are. So you can see the M's right here. And that is going to be under color. All right, so that's line six. If everybody wants, anybody wants to go check, that's a 1850 Ohio Census record and line six. Line six for Harriet Callum. Right here. All right, so she's mulatto, and we already know what when we see this word mulatto, what it means. Uh, you know, these are code words, and uh, you know they were labeling uh, American natives mulatto constantly during this time. And then the next one we're going to look at is the uh, 1880 census. So by this time, she's married to um, Harlan Early, which is her husband. Okay. And what is she like to do? And then on this particular census, she's labeled her race as white. White? Yeah. So I don't know how that's possible. So how'd she go from mulatto to white? Right. Right. So let's let's uh, let's check out the uh, census records here, and y'all and you guys. So here they are. So you want to see something very interesting here? Look at this. Everybody's white now, the whole family. Yeah. White, Everybody. white. Wow. So that's the 1880 Ohio United States federal census. Okay. And just so everybody can see it, it's under the category race. And she's in uh, line 12. Line 12, yes, sir. So we are going to go to the, let's see, 1910 United States Federal Census. And um, as everybody can see, same name, same person. And as you can see here, race black wow all right so she went from mulatto to white now she's black again <laughs> yeah, that's crazy <laughs> yeah, they yeah. Just, i guess her skin couldn't figure out what, what color it wanted to be right uh, so let's go into the uh, census again and i'm gonna try to zoom in here so we can get a little closer but the highlighted areas there, that's the family. All right, so now you can see the family members have gone back, you know, to black. Wow. And uh, one interesting thing is, is we still got um, a granddaughter that's shown up as mulatto. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so. And but yeah, uh, here, here she is on line uh, 29. Okay, and that granddaughter, um, does that granddaughter happen to have any white relatives or parents? Uh, not that I know of. Okay, I mean, it's, it's, why would they put her in Malawi? You can see the scribble too. So, mm -hmm. I where they, yeah. yeah, where they tried to put different things in here. Actually, you can see it on all of these letters if you really look. Yep. You get a chance to zoom in on that. Pure mail. It's a uh, yeah. You can see where it's been changed. Yeah, it's clear. It's clear. 
I think this calls for more investigation and uh, you know, if we gotta we gotta really show you know more of this going on because this is how they able to you know pretty much to me man take away you know the the, the lineage man I mean. But even with the status thing, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, of course, I'm sure Mulatto would have been kind of like a, a considered, you know, not such a high status, you know, since you basically this, this is a, a you know, mixed, mixed person or whatever you want to call it. And then to go from white and then the black, I mean, Yo, that's just not, it doesn't make any sense at all, man. I mean, all right. okay. What's more important about this is uh, because they, we got people that play dumb, right? And, and when they do their lives and, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna name them. S.A. Nader, uh, Jabari. They seem to act like they don't know that these uh, websites are backed up by official census records. Thanks. All right, and uh, they're, they play dumb to everybody and everybody who follows them is falling for it. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, so we got to really look into your genealogy, look at all the uh, misinformation that's in it, because you can see how they play around with your ancestors, uh, you know, color, classification, uh, the tags that we're putting on them. We already talked about the mulatto or what that means, colored, you know, uh, and so we can see, you know, happening. Um, I mean, the first two people that showed me their gene genealogical record, this is what I'm seeing. A third person sent it to me. Same thing. I guarantee if everybody starts doing this, they're gonna find the same things. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. Now the just just to, just to note one more other thing. Um, on a lot of the uh, genealogy that I've been doing, um, going back into you know all these families, um, you know once again. Um, I know that Jabari and um, S.A. Nader was asking about, you know, how how does Phoenix Moon know that these people aren't African? Because, you know, they're, they're not listed as African or saying that they're from, you know, any part of that continent or that area, you know. So, I mean, I'm getting back into the 1600s on some of these lines. And, you know, I'm getting like, you know, European places, but I'm not getting any anything African on here. So, you know, just like she said, we haven't found it yet, so I can't claim it. All right, definitely. That's one of the uh, important things about this is that you're not going to see the word Africa or African anywhere in this. And we have uh, pointed out, Wanagi has pointed out that he did find it in one case. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's uh, listed. We're not saying that nobody, that some people are not African, but when they are, it actually shows that their parents came from Africa, they trace it. So it, it, if it was a general rule, we would see that for everybody. We shouldn't, you know, just find it on one person out of millions. That's right. I agree, man, because, I mean, for it to be such a, a, a ancient place and, and, you know, to carry such ancient lineages, you know, for so many people to come through, like like you said, that's the first time, you know, when Go showed that, that's the first time I've seen one also. So this is a very serious deal, I mean, to me, you know, because, I mean, when you, when you know, when you know to look in the law, you know, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, you're seeing rights being stripped away. So this is, this is, this is major, man. Like you said, though, I mean, with the African thing, we all know that that term really didn't become into play till the 1800s or late 1800s at that, when actual Africans did really come here, you know, it's recorded. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Empress, what do you think about that? I am mean, asking the same way. Okay. The ones that I was able to find, they were the same way. Mulatto, a black and, and Negro. So, uh, and then the ones I seen that was white, I didn't, you know, once I seen it, it said white, I came out of there. I'm like, well, them couldn't be my, my people. Then when he just said that 
they they can still be your people. They just changed them to white. So that's why that's why I got confused because I was like, well, some of these people is white. So wow. now I see you know, where I got stuck at. Yeah, that, and that's important. That's, that's that's good you said that because, I mean, so you also found your relatives being classified as white. And that's that's true what you're saying. I mean, that would throw somebody off and be like, this is not my relative. And, and that's important to know because now you really, really, really got to research and really think of, like, when you're seeing this uh, classification, like white, mulatto, you know, you got to really understand why they were doing it. And that's why, you know, I want to show this article. You know, that, that we're talking about in the video. B. Robin versus Hardaway, the beginning of the end. Robin versus Hardaway was yet another Indian freedom suit. Unlike earlier cases, though, the suit challenged the legality of Indian slavery itself rather than li litigating the plaintiff's particular circumstances. The resulting decision heralded a watershed in the legal connection between race and slavery as it began the process of judicially abolishing Indian slavery. There were 12 plaintiffs in Robin, all slaves in Dinwiddle County, who claimed trespass, assault, battery, and false imprisonment against their owners for their illegal detention and slavery. All were descended from Indian women. All were Indians. You hear this, right? All these plaintiffs were Indians. But they were, what, in a slave plantation? Who was supposed to be in the slave plantation? You, right, so-called Negro? But these were Indians who were fighting for their freedom in court, all right? All were descended from Indian women, a fact that went unchallenged at trial. The sole legal issue was the validity of the 1682 statute that provided for Indian enslavement. The question the lawyers addressed, therefore, was when the act was repealed and whether it it ever was. The statutory claims. Number one, George Mason argued on behalf of the plaintiffs that the Virginia Assembly had repealed the 1682 statute on three separate occasions in 1684, 1691, and 1705. Since his clients descended from Indians enslaved after 1705, they were legally entitled to freedom under any of these statutes. Mason's arguments demonstrated subtle lawyering. He argued, for instance, that the reference to servants in the 1682 law could not apply to Indians, since it is notorious there is no such thing as servitude known among any of the Indian tribes. The only Indian slaves the legislature could have meant were those enslaved during Bacon's Rebellion, and since the assembly had repealed all the laws enacted during Bacon's Rebellion in 1684, no Indians could have been enslaved after that time. You hear that? But they were still doing it. In case this logic did not persuade, Mason pointed to two other laws that repealed the 1682 Act. He insisted that an act of 1691 that allowed free trade with Indians also implied that the 1682 law had been repealed. After all, he suggested how could Indians peaceably trade if they were subject to enslavement? Such an imputation would do indignity to any legislation. Finally, Mason pointed to the provision of the 1705 Virginian Slave Code that proclaimed that all non-Christian servants shall be accounted slaves. Again, Mason insisted Indians were not servants when they were imported, and since this law supplanted all earlier legislation on the subject, it repealed in 1682 law. Under the new law, Indians could no longer be servants or slaves. Again, key thing he mentioned here, imported. So Indians being imported, I thought it was Africans. All right. Colonel Richard Bland, the prominent Virginia lawyer representing the owner, attacked Mason's liberties with the statutory history. He noted that Indian and African slavery predated the 1682 law, and he demonstrated that the law was primarily intended to repeal the glaring absurdity of the 1670s law's distinction between servants who arrived by land and those who came by sea. He also castigated Mason's interpretation of 1691 Act, ensuring free trade, which conflated laws relative to slavery with those relative to trade. Finally, Bland compared the 1682 and the 1705 laws side by side and demonstrated that the language was nearly identical, suggesting that the legislature intended to reinforce, not repeal, the 1682 law. Bland's arguments were legally and historically stronger. 
Mason's claims that servitude did not exist among Indians directly contradicted the Assembly's understanding when it enacted the 1682 law. Mason's readings of the 1691 and 1705 Acts were similarly mistaken. The Assembly probably did not intend the 1691 Act to end Indian slavery, since the Burgesses drew a sharp distinction between friendly and hostile Indians. As for the legislature that drafted the 1705 law defining slavery, it primarily had imported African slaves in mind, since the transatlantic slave trade was the colony's most vital source of labor, dodged the hijack. But numerous other provisions of the slave code imposed disabilities on both Africans and Indians. Most problematic for Mason's argument, though, was historical practice. Virginian officials continued to speak of and treat enslaved Indians as slaves even after the 1705 law. Mason's view invented a dramatic legal change that no one at the time observed or obeyed. Thus Mason's history bore little resemblance to the actual evolution of Indian slavery in Virginia. This gap underscores the social transformation that had occurred in the colony since the beginning of the 18th century. Indian slavery had become so invisible that Mason confidently argued that the institution had been outlawed three quarters of a century earlier. Number two, the natural law claims. Making Indians white. Part two, number two, the natural law claims. Mason's most radical arguments rested on a natural law, not the assembly's enactments. He asserted that the 1682 law legitimizing the enslavement of Indians violated God's law and was therefore invalid, since all acts of legislature apparently contrary to natural right and justice are void. This claim rested on the belief that positive law was subordinate to a more fundamental natural law. A widespread enlightenment believed that gained particular salience in America with the pre-evolutionary protests against British authority. As Mason argued, the law of nature are the laws of God, whose authority can be superseded by no power on earth. Mason described the settlement of America as an unwarranted invasion as the colonists by force disposed the Indians of the wilds they had inhabited from the creation of the world. Those Indians who acknowledged European authority did so through sol solemn treaties that preserved their freedom, not through the servile submission of individuals to individuals. This certainly precluded enslavement, as no instance can be produced where even heathens have imposed slavery on a free people, in peace with them. As for hostile Indians, Masons rejected the standard just war, argument legitimating the enslavement of captives. Regardless of who commenced the hostilities, it was the Indians, he emphasized, who were fighting just wars, since they were defending their lands against outside invaders. In a final re rhetorical flourish, Mason explicitly linked these debates over Indian slavery with the colonists' struggles against British assertions of sovereignty. And it says here, the Indians of every denomination, example, friendly and hostile, were free and independent of us. They were not subject to our empire, not represented in our legislature. They derived no protection from our laws, nor could be subjected to their bonds. If natural right, independence, defect of representation and disavowal of protection are not sufficient to keep them from the coercion of our laws. On what other principles can we justify our opposition to some late acts of power exercised over us by the British legislature? Yet they only pretended to impose on us a paltry tax and money. We on our free neighbors, the joke of perpetual slavery. Mason does argue that Indian slavery violated natural laws, limits on sovereignty. Such arguments were hazardous, for their logic threatened undetermined a society predicated on inequality and forced labor. And Rebuto Colonel Bland disputed the premise that a court could simply disregard a law that it believed violated natural law. Nonetheless, he argued Indian slavery did not violate natural law. Echoing slavery's later apologist Bland relied on biblical and English history to demonstrate that natural law encompasses both hierarchy and slavery. In particular, he addressed the much more economically important institution of African slavery, Dash the Hijack. But in proper perspective, Bland suggested the laws enslaving Indians were much less unjust than the laws making slaves of Negroes, inhabitants of Africa.
After all, the Indians had constantly attacked the English, and so the Virginians had enslaved the natives based on the principles of self-defense. You hear what he was using as an argument? By contrast, the Africans in Africa could never endure our properties or disturb our peace. Huh. Yet there is no objection made to the validity of the Negro laws on account of their injustice. Bland called forth the, the specter of African slavery that loomed over all arguments over freedom in natural law and Revolutionary War era Virginia. Confronted with Bland's rebuttal, Mason's task mirrored the larger challenge that confronted all Virginia's would-be revolutionaries, explaining why some people deserve to be naturally free, white colonists and Indians, while others deserve perpetual servitude. Mason's conceded his argument implications for African slavery, but he insisted that it was less unjust than the enslavement of Indians. For the Africans are absolute slaves in their own country, he claimed, none but the king being a free man there. African slavery only continued a slavery which existed before, whereas to the Indians, the slavery is created by the axe. All right, so he's arguing, Mason, that, you know, well, Africans were slaves always, so well, I'm not talking about Africans. Indians were not slaves, so they shouldn't be slaves. So he was still racist, you can tell, right? Mason thus attempted to rehabilitate his natural law argument through an appeal to his era's distinction between naturally free natives and naturally depraved Africans. Slavery was fit for one, he implied, but not the other. And therefore his listeners should not hear in his words a coded argument for abolition. Mason's natural law claims threatened to nullify statutes wherever a lawyer could compelling argue for the fundamental law. They also dangerously exposed the capriciousness of slavery and its weak justification. The radicalism inherited in the revolutionary moment and the need for the colony slaveholders to contain it acquired urgency in this argument over Indian slavery. Number three, the outcome and the puzzle. We're talking about the case, right? Robin versus Hardaway. The court's decision has survived as a single line. The court had judged that neither of the acts 1684 or 1691 repealed that of 1682, but that it was repealed by the act of 1705. The court declared that plaintiffs, free and not slaves, and ordered that the defendants pay their costs as well as one shilling in damages. So they got their freedom, right? He was able, Mason was able to get these American natives their freedom. And he even got them to get some uh, payment for damages. Their freedom won. The various plaintiffs thereafter vanished from the historical record. They, These free people who won a court case vanished from your textbooks, basically. Their brief encounter with momentous legal debates over. The decision itself left a greater legacy. Indian freedom suits no longer turned solely on the mother status. Instead, except for a brief 23-year window between 1682 and 1705, when sanctioned by law, Indian slavery was presumptively illegal in Virginia. Indian racial identity itself, like whiteness and unlike blackness, now offered a possible route to freedom. The decision also left a puzzle. With no written opinion, the court gave no explanation for its rejection of Bland's well-reasoned arguments in favor of Mason's convoluted ones. And since later opinions simply accepted Robin's conclusion that the 1705 Act ended legal slavery for Indians, no satisfying account was ever provided. On their dramatic redefinition of Indians' status, the Virginian courts remained silent that time there was a lot of people that was using what we call pencil genocide in other words they were changing documents in the town halls in this and that and uh, unless you had some question about it you didn't even know it so for example uh, in my dad's family uh, my aunt Marion my aunt Josephine and my uncle Lewis were down as Indian. Uncle Lawrence and my father were down as black. My mother's birth certificate, she was born in uh, on Cogswell Street, which is uh, Pawcatuck, Connecticut. And the doctor, knowing that she wasn't black, naturally, because he was very well familiar with the Babcock family, put her down as white. And a lot of us were put down as white just so we would not have that stigma of being black. C. Robbins progeny. The decision in Robin did not immediately abolish Indian slavery. First, no published account of Robin existed until 1829, so its direct legal influence was limited. 
Moreover, the case merely substantiated a new test for freedom. Whether a slave's Indian ancestor had been enslaved before 1705, for the older determination through reputation evidence of the legal status of the slave's mother, this new test was not necessarily more favorable to the descendants of enslaved natives, because most Indian slaves in Virginia had been enslaved prior to 1705, and later enslavement was difficult to prove. This reality quickly became apparent. After Robin, many slaves flocked to the courts to bring their suits. In October 1772, Paul Michaux advertised for Jim, a runaway slave who pretends to have a right to his freedom by virtue of his half Indian descent. So remember, we went over the uh, runaway slave ads, right? Here's another one where the guy is saying, hey, be careful. This guy is saying he's free, but he's not free. But this guy was really free, and that's why he ran away. He was an American Indian. He knew he wasn't supposed to be enslaved. When he went away, Mishaks wrote, I expected he was gone to the general court to seek for his freedom. Less than a year later, David, allegedly of the Indian breed, again, remember this, of the Indian breed, we got this in the runaway ads on the last video, on part five, also supposedly ran down to the general court to sue for his freedom. If they made it to court, these two slaves and many others were likely deeply disappointed. In June 1772, the court confronted a multitude of cases filed by the descendants of Indian slaves, but reiterated its verdict from Robin that the 1682 law remained in effect until 1705 and thus gave judgment against many descendants of Indians introduced and held as slaves between 1682 and 1705. The court unwillingly to interpret Robin as a blanket prohibition against Indian slavery maintained its narrow interpretation. Virginia's highest court recast as the Supreme Court of Appeals in the post-revolutionary reforms of Virginia's judiciary finally revisited the legality of Indian slavery in 1787. In Hannah v. Davis, John Marshall, James Monroe, and others represented plaintiffs claiming descent from Bess, who was a jury who a jury had determined was an Indian imported after 1705. Imported. Imported from where? The president of Robin had seemingly been forgotten since Hannah relitigated the same legal question. When was the 1682 law allowing Indian slavery repealed? With nearly the same arguments, plaintiffs' counsel echoed Mason's statutory claims asserting that the 1682 act was null and void since it violated the law of God and the law of nature to make slaves of the Indians. The defendant's counsel countered that the argument against slavery applies equally to African as to Indian nations and insisted that if the burden of proof were placed on the slaveholder, it must be attended with almost universal emancipation. The result in the case was the same as in Robin. The court unanimously ruled that the 1682 Act was absolutely repealed in 1705. Hannah's duplication of Robin still did not resolve the legality of Indian slavery, for like Robin, the case went unreported. Only five years after Hannah, another enslaved plaintiff faced the Supreme Court of Appeals in the case of Jenkins v. Tom. Tom and other Northumberland County slaves introduced the affidavits of Antian's people to prove descent from two women who were called Indians and had tawny complexions. Again, tawny. Africans were being called tawny. Indians were being called tawny in these historical accounts we saw in the past videos. With long straight black hair, when they allegedly arrived in Virginia in 1705, arrived from where? When the defendant attempted to argue that, the, that Indian slavery was legal before 1705, the judge intervened and instructed the counsel that he had misstated the law. There had indeed been a law that permitted Indian enslavement at some period in the last century, but it was some time after repealed from which period no American Indian could be sold as slave. All the Indians enslaved after that point who had sued for freedom, he informed the counsel, had uniformly recovered it. The lawyer, upset that this exchange had biased the jury, appealed and lost. The Supreme Court of Virginia affirmed without elaboration. What then was the law on Indian slavery? The general framework of Robin survived Indian slavery was legal at some period. 
illegal, sometimes of after. But the details upon which the hopes of so many slaves rested remained vague and thus invited further litigation. The court did not have to wait long. The following year it heard a similar case in which slaves had been declared free after the jury found that they were maternally descended from Judith, an Indian brought to Virginia. Brought from where? Sometime after the year 1705. The appellant denied that the 1705 law outlawed Indian slavery but lost. The appellee's, the appellee's counsel also failed, though for he could not convince the judges to adopt his sweeping assertion that when we speak of an Indian, unqualified by circumstances of any sort, we certainly speak of a free man, and if an Englishman had been mentioned, the court instead introduced an odd new distinction between American Indians who could no longer be enslaved after 1705 and foreign Indians. Foreign Indians in parentheses, these are the so-called Negroes, these are the so-called Africans they were bringing uh, to replace the so-called Indian labor. Who could? All right, so foreign Indians. Unable to decide whether Judith came by land or by sea, the evenly divided court affirmed. This lack of consensus revealed the ongoing confusion over the legal status of the descendants of enslaved natives. Yet amid the impressive distinctions and arbitrary dates, slaves exploited their Indian identity to achieve freedom. Despite doctrinal ambiguity, the plaintiffs in these cases all prevailed and secured their freedom. All, all these plaintiffs who were considered Negro slaves were actually Indians and they were all successful in securing their freedom. Did you know that? Did you know so-called Negro slaves can sue for their freedom? Did you know that? Clarity finally came more than a decade later in a pair of cases that established the precise date after which enslavement of Indians was no longer legal and that made explicit and long latent presumption in favor of Indian freedom. The first issue was resolved in Palace versus Hill, the freedom suit of numerous descendants of an American Indian named Bess, brought to Virginia in 1703. Again, brought from where? By this point, there was little doubt that Indian enslavement was illegal after 1705. When the appealed attempted to controvert what, the, what he regarded as this erroneous doctrine, the court refused permission, noting that the principle settled so long ago by the general court was the law of the land confirmed by successive adjudications. But since Bess was enslaved in 1703, this pronouncement was not this positive. The real issue in the case was a new discovery. St. George Tucker had found an identical manuscript copy of the 1705 law enacted in 1691. The judges convinced of the law's authenticity declared that henceforth no Native American Indian brought into Virginia since the year 1691 could under any circumstances be lawfully made a slave the plaintiffs received a new trial that would undoubtedly find them free and the widow window for the lawful enslavement of natives shrank to a mere dozen years over a century earlier. The long and chaotic debate over the statutes of defining Indian slavery ended at last. Yet Hudgens v. Wrights decided two years earlier was the more important case in which a straightforward question over the burden of proof re reconfigured the legal meaning of Indian identity in Virginia, the slaves in Hutchkins, about to be sold away from Virginia, quickly filed a freedom suit in the High Court of Chancery, claiming descent from an Indian named Butterwood Nan. Chancellor George Whitty declared the plaintiffs wrongly enslaved and on the ground that freedom is the birthright of every human being, which sentiment is strongly inculcated by the first article of our Bill of Rights. Also placed the burden of proof in all freedom suits on the defendant. On appeal, the Supreme Court of Appeals introduced a racial distinction into wheat's sweeping holding. This counsel for the appeals observed was not a common case for mere blacks suing for their freedom, but of persons perfectly white. Since according to the court, all white persons are in ever been free in this country. 
when one evidently white be notwithstanding claimed as a slave, the proof lies on the party claiming to make the other his slave. American Indians too. The court declared without the hesitation one might expect after a, such a long and tortured history of conflicting case law, where prima facie free. The court thus approved Witt's reasoning so far as the same relates to white persons and Native American Indians, but refused to extend his evidentiary principle to Native Africans and their descendants, dodged the hijack, other so-called American Negroes that were coming from other parts of America. The court recognized that these presumptions of status posed a significant challenge in application, since they traced the threshold issue of racial determination, which was often dispositive of freedom suits. But Judge Tucker, for one, believed that this difficulty could be resolved through common sense racial stereotyping, the distinction between the natives of Africa and the aborigines of America. Was so pointed, he wrote, that a man might as easily mistake the glossy, jetty clothing of an American bear for the wool of a black sheep, as the hair of an American Indian for that of an African, or the descendant of an African. Such evidence affected which party bore the burden of proof, but it could also prove this positive on its own. In Hudgens itself, for instance, the long straight black hair of Butterwood Nan's daughter helped establish her Indian identity. You hear that? Such crude stereotypes have prompted considerable scholarly attention, but most freedom suits had long depended on the perception of the racial identity of the plaintiff, albeit rarely so explicitly. The absence of written documentation and the widespread use of reputation evidence meant that popular understanding of race based on primarily on physical appearance inevitably determined such cases particularly when the slaves in question claimed descent from whites. This had not been true for the descendants of Indians, however, whose statues in the colonial era depended on their mother's legal status or even after Robin hinged on the date of their ancestors' enslavement. What was new in Tucker's opinion, therefore, was the suggestion that Indian identity alone made the plaintiffs prima facie free. Unconcerned with the dates, and statues that so preoccupied prior courts, Tucker did not dwell into the complicated history of Butterwood's Nan's importation. Importation from where? It was enough for him that the plaintiffs looked the path, the part. As the court ruling made it clear, blackness remained both the legal and popular badge of slavery. So blackness was synonymous with slavery while Indians would henceforth join whites in presumptive freedom. Hudgens ended the long and complicated road that began with Robin. Hudgens was not the last Indian freedom suit. On at least two more occasions before the Civil War, the Supreme Court of Appeals clarified the legal framework it had elaborated. But these cases turned on whether the slaves in question were actually Indians. In the fundamental divide between slave and free, black and white, that characterized antebellum Virginia society, Indians now enjoyed the liberty that had previously been the sole privilege of whiteness. The incremental nature of this legal transformation obscured its radicalism. Each decision expanded the prohibition against Indian slavery only slightly, yet the cumulative effect was dramatic and sweeping. In the space of a generation, the Virginia courts eliminated an institution that had been widely accepted from the earliest settlement and that had existed without legal challenge for over a century. Indian identity became gradually a path to freedom. Half a surly, Virginia's highest court had judicially abolished Indian slavery. This abolition contrasted sharply with Virginia courts in action on African slavery. African slavery was obviously a far more economical and socially important institution than Indian servitude, but its existence raised even deeper anxieties among its practitioners. Virginia's elite realized that all perpetual bondage, whether of Indians or Africans, conflicted with the principles of natural law. Yet Virginia's courts and legislature made only a few half-hearted efforts to ameliorate African slavery, or 
American Indian slavery. Even as they boldly abolished the enslavement of Indians, this contrast raises the question, why did the abolition of Indian slavery occur at all? All right, that's the end of uh, part two of this uh, article. And again, remember, we are in part nine of this series from Indigenous American to African American. Just want to remind you, you know, you got to dodge your own hijack when you hear African. We've already gone through all the information in the past videos. This is just a quick reminder. Again, it says here uh, in the book, The American Nations or Outlines of Their general history ancient and modern including the whole history of the earth and mankind in the western hemisphere the philosophy of american history the annals traditions civilizations languages of all the american nations tribes empires and states all right this is by c.s rafinsky first volume it says here a black people came to haiti from the south or southeast from had from who had darts of guanin metal and were called the black Guaninis, so they were coming from South America, and, and we had got Columbus actually who gave this account uh, to everybody as well. This tradition, preserved by Hereda, Garcia, and Charleville, indicates a colony of Negroes or men painting black from South America. They might be the black Negroes of Quarecua, mentioned by Dangleria, or some other American Negro nation, of which there are many. Again, or some other American Negro nation of which there are many. There are many. See my account of ancient black nations of America. Dangleria mentions two wild tribes. American anthropography will teach that there were men of all sizes, features, and complexions in this hemisphere before 1492. There were men of all sizes, features, and complexions, many shades in this hemisphere before Columbus came. Notwithstanding the false assertions of many writers who take one nation for the whole American group, the Uxis, the Puruas, the Parias, the Chons were as white as the Spaniards or as light, right? That very light. Fifty such tribes were found in South America, while many tribes of Choco, right, or dark, the Manabis, the Yarudas, and were as black as Negroes, as black as Negroes. All the other shades of brown, Tani, there we go, Tani, Tani and Coppery were scattered everywhere. Thanks for being here. Hawa bless.